I appreciate all those who, who prayed for my safety while I was gone on a fishing trip with, with Micah and I was with my dad and my brother and my nephew. I appreciate the prayer for safety, but next time please pray for some fish too. Because we didn't even get a single bite. That's right, I didn't take Wilbur, that's the problem. <laughs> Wilbur's the only man I know. You find a puddle of water, he can pull a fish right out of there. But it's a great day to be in God's house, and we're so thankful that each and every one of you are here. Any guests or visitors, you'll find a, a little insert in your bulletin, and that's just to give us a record of your account of being here, plus an opportunity if you have any prayer requests that you'd like for us to pray about, and you can fill that out and drop it in the box in the back, and we'll be faithful to pray over those things. So. It's a great, wonderful day. It's good to have Lance back with us. And let's worship this morning. Let's stand and sing as we start worship this morning.
between getting stabbed a few times and being stuck on addiction, and fighting, and electrocutions, and you name it, I've been through the ringer. I just kind of ran into a brick wall, found myself going nowhere fast, very fast. Now I'm serving as a worship leader at a church, part of a church plant. I'm a supervisor at a huge company. I'm the face of the church most of the time, just being up there singing. And I, I realized that God had a purpose for me of being in service. People looking to me for godly advice, like, you know, when did that happen? How did that happen? It's amazing. Praise the Lord indeed. Amen. Amen. Hey guys, uh, we are also having uh, here, don't forget, on the 27th here, uh, Soul Day Jalisco's, we have the men's Bible, uh, uh, Bible breakfast. And uh, also, that day, we're also going to have a church-wide work day. Yay! Let's give a round of applause. Getting some stuff done around the church. Woo! Hey man. Uh, everybody gets fired up for work, yes? Yeah? So, anyway, they need help cleaning and repairing the church on the inside and outside. Uh, the more we have, uh, basically, the more we get done on that day, the better this place is going to be. And actually more enticing to people to the kingdom of God. Uh, so, that's very important. Hey, Women's Fellowship on the 29th at 6 p.m. for ladies 6th grade and up. Join them for food, fun, and fellowship. And here is posted our Easter Sunday schedule. We hope you'll also make plans for that. Well, anything else you need, guys, don't forget, it's all in your bulletin. But let's take part in our scripture study and by studying God's word more at this time. I got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look around. Uh-oh. The guy's supposed to read that's not here. <laughs> Hopefully I'll be loud enough because I'm going to have to read it off there. James, chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. Know this, my beloved brothers, that every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive the meekness, the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, with open hearts, with open minds. Ready, O oh Lord, to receive your word. Ready, O oh Lord, to be obedient, Father, to your will. To what you would have us to do to serve you in this community. Father God, we pray for the lost, Father. For those brothers and sisters, Father, who aren't here this morning for whatever reason. Be with them, Lord. Keep them safe from all harm. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity that we have. This building, Lord, that you provided, this house, oh God, your house, the house of worship. We ask, oh God, that we as your people, we as a family, Lord, will always, always look to you for our next step, for what we need to do, Lord, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father God, I lift up our pastor, Father, and I pray, that, Lord, that you'll be with him as he speaks this morning. You have given him word, Lord. Clear his mind of all thoughts except sharing your word with us. That it may touch our hearts and draw us closer to you. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for we are all sinners. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother, for that scripture. Let's stand and sing as we continue to worship this morning. Oh, 
my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease.
time, at some point this week, got angry. Right? Everybody look around the room. If you're not raising your hand, you are either incredibly self-controlled person or you are lying this morning. So I think all of us can admit at one point or another in our life we have lost our temper. If you've seen the uh, show, please don't get your theology from it <laughs> at all. Uh, inside out, that little red guy is the one that represents the anger. And all of us have that emotion, that emotion of anger. It brings up a question this morning, another question. Is it wrong to be angry? We're going to explore that just a little bit more as we dive into God's Word. We're continuing uh, our series on the Sermons on the Mount. Hopefully you're already there. Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 21 through 26. Please stand, if you will, in honor of reading God's Word. As Matthew records and Jesus preaches, You've heard that it was said to our ancestors, Do not murder. And whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. And whoever says to his brother, fool, will be subject to the Sanhedrin. But whoever says, you moron, will be subject to hell fire. So if you are offering your gift on the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother, and then come and offer your gifts. Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on the way with him, or your adversary will hand you over to the judge. The judge to the officer, and you will be thrown into prison. I assure you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we confess that we have finite minds, and you are infinite. And without you and without your spirit, we cannot understand or comprehend your word. So we ask you this morning to give us wisdom. Open our eyes and our ears and our heart to receive the message that you have for us from your word, Father. And Father, keep me from saying anything contrary to your word. Father, may you speak to us. May you edify us. May you convict us. May you encourage us. May you comfort us. May you challenge us, challenge us from your word. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. May be seated. Now this is the beginning of six different passages, six different sections where Jesus is going to have, we're going to see this repetition of Jesus saying, you have heard it said. And then he mentions what they said. And then he says, but I tell you, Jesus is clarifying, he is expounding on these commands that they have said, some of them directly from the commandments, some of them from the different traditions and other sources of law that the Pharisees had instituted. And it's important to note here that at no point does Jesus ever disagree or deny God's word. He does not say, you heard it said, do not commit murder, but I'm going to tell you, it's okay if you do. He's not going to say that. In fact, what he's directly dealing with is not the Word, not Scripture, not God's commands, but what they have heard, what they have been taught. He says, you have heard. This is what's been presented to you. This is how it's been told or taught. Let me tell you what it really means. So he's dealing with what the Pharisees and the scribes and the other religious leaders have expounded on and how they were incorrect in their understanding of God's word and his commands. And there's a few things that this passage is about, and we could apply these to all six of them, but we're going to look at them specifically this morning. In this passage, it's first about righteousness. 
righteousness. This is coming right on the heels of the previous passage we went through. There's a reason that we uh, teach expositorily, that we go verse by verse through many passages. We do take times where we do a different kind of series and things, but primarily we go verse by verse because what comes next follows what just was said. When we looked at it last week, Jesus was talking about how he fulfilled the law. And if you were here last week, or even if you weren't, hearing that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, you might have been excited because that meant that we don't have to listen to the law anymore. Those of you who are here know that that is incorrect. And if that was your view, then you are very disappointed. God calls us to continue to follow the law. Jesus says, Little is the one who breaks these commandments and teaches others. Great is the one who keeps these commandments. And the Bible rightly tells us and says and calls us, be holy as he is holy. Jesus ended the last passage in verse 24. I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of, get, uh, the kingdom of heaven. Now, we talked about how uh, there's a difference between worldly, selfly righteousness and then the righteousness that comes from God. And we are declared righteous not because of anything we have done or accomplished, but because of Christ in us. And that's true. And we are still called to be holy. We're still called to righteous, to live a right life. And so as we enter into these next six passages, Jesus is going forth and telling us and showing us how we can be righteous, how we can live a righteous life. Now that righteousness does not save us, but because we are saved, this is how we live. There's a difference between those two. It's about righteousness. And he deals with this first one. Do not murder. You have heard it said, to our ancestors, do not murder. Now, if you remember the Ten Commandments, you'll remember that that is the Sixth Commandment. We went over this with our youth <laughs> just this past weekend. Uh, how to remember the Ten Commandments. There's little hand signs you can remember all of them. And if you get it in your mind, then you, you got it. Sixth Commandments, do not murder. Because pretend you're pointing a gun at an other person. You're going to kill him. Do not murder. We'll go over the ten, the other nine another day. But he's dealing with the sixth commandment here. Do not murder. Now, this is probably the easiest of the ten commandments that we can go to and say, Oh, I can check that one off the list. I haven't killed anybody yet. In fact, let's take a poll. This could be a little scary here. <laughs> How many of you murdered somebody this week? I don't see anybody's hand. Woo! Someone raised their hands, we would have a different issue this morning. But that's the easiest commandment of the ten, right? That we can mark off as, man, I'm good, I got it. I'm done. I haven't killed anybody. I may have wanted to kill somebody, but I didn't do it. That's righteous. And Jesus says it goes deeper than that. It goes much more farther than that. You've heard it said to our ancestors, do not murder. And whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. This is not a passage about whether or not you should be a murderer. And just a side note here. There is a difference. It doesn't say kill, does it? It says murder. There is a difference between murdering someone and then killing someone. Because there are places and times where, where that is not considered murder when someone passes away. Um, like in battles or war, that would be considered not murder. In self-defense, if someone is attacking you and trying to do harm or killing you, you don't want, you didn't set out to kill them, but because of defending yourself, you might have to. 
And then lastly, of course, by accident. By accident. And when you look back in God's Word, especially in the Old Testament, and you look at this commandment and all the rules and laws that came with it, <coughs> there was always provision for those. If you killed somebody by accident, if it was self-defense, or if it was in a time of war or battle. Murder <coughs> is the act of seeking someone's life. We're going to see in just a few minutes, it comes from a heart of anger. But this passage isn't around whether or not you can be uh, a murderer. This passage is about righteousness. And it goes further than just whether or not you've killed someone. D.A. Carson put it this way. One has not conformed to be the better righteousness of the kingdom simply by refraining from homicide. So by looking at that sixth commandment, do not murder, we can't check the box off and say, I haven't killed anybody. I'm a better person. I'm a better Christian. I've lived a righteous life because I haven't killed anybody today. That's not what Jesus is saying. And that's not what that commandment means. So Jesus expounds on this. He says, do not murder. You've heard it said, do not murder. But I tell you, just a side note. After every segment in these six passages, you'll see Jesus say, I tell you, this is a place of authority. And we know that when Jesus speaks, it is God's word. Jesus says, but I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. You see, it's about righteousness, but it is also about Anger. Anger. And Jesus expounds on this sixth commandment and brings us to this better understanding. There is something that we have a problem with. See, we're good with the fact that we haven't killed anybody. We can check that off as righteousness. But when you get the more full understanding about not being angry, then it becomes a problem. Because all of us here have admitted that we have been angry this week. We have lost our temper. Anger seems to be one of the sins that we're okay with in our life. Because it's so easily justified, right? Right? And oftentimes, we push the responsibility off on other people. Why are you angry? Because you made me angry. Right? Just the title of the sermon today. Losing our temper. How many of you have ever lost your temper? Where did it go? <laughs> Let me look around. I, I'm sure I can find it. But we say things like that. I've lost my temper. You're making me angry. We push the responsibility off of ourselves and onto somebody else, and that then becomes our justification. I'm angry because someone else has made me angry. It's not my fault. It's not my fault at all. I once heard a pastor say he has buttons. And people keep pushing his buttons. No one's greater at that than your children. And it seems like the more children you have, the more buttons you have, right? Well, I was fine till you pushed my button. We pass the buck. We try to move the responsibility over to somebody else. It's not my fault that I'm angry. It's your fault that I'm angry. If you would just do what I wanted you to do, or have left me alone, or didn't push that button, then I wouldn't be angry. So this is not my fault, it's your fault, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to agree with. Something we have to learn, and still continually learn as adults. You are responsible for your actions and your emotions. No one is responsible for them but you. Jesus says, but I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. 
Whoever says to his brother, fool, will be subject to the Sanhedrin. But whoever says, you moron, will be subject to hell fire. Now, we might come to this in point and say, well, it seems like there's this growing judgment that happens. But I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here. We see different, definitely three different kinds of forms of anger here. First, he says, there is just a generic anger. I tell you, verse 22, everyone who is angry with his brother. And then secondly, he says, uh, those who call their brother fool or raka might say raka. And if it doesn't say raka, if it says fool, you probably have a footnote. You can go down. What does raka mean? It simply means empty, literally means empty. But what it stands for is to be empty headed. What we would say a fool. So we move from anger to insult. We insult one another. Guess why? We're angry. And then last we see um, him say, but whoever says you moron, which is a denunciation, a condemnation of someone's character. And there's not, the point is not that it's growing, and there's not this growing judgment. And when he says hellfire here, it means Gehenna. Gehenna was the place outside of the city. At one point, they did uh, uh, human sacrifices, but after that point, this is where they took all the city's garbage and refuge, and they, they would burn it. It became a symbol of what hell was going to be like. Burning in Gehenna, or a hellfire. Jesus is saying that you might live a life where you have never taken another person's life. You've never murdered anyone. But you are still under the wrath of God and subject to judgment. It's more than just murder. It's being angry. Now there is a difference between kinds of anger isn't there? Because God's word tells us, uh, like Psalms chapter 4, verse 4, be angry and do not sin. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Chapter 4, verse 26. It says, do not let, do, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. So God tells, God's word tells us in some places that you can be angry and not sin, right? And we know from the example of Jesus in the temple, do you think he had a smile as he was going and carefully tipping the tables over of the, the, the people who were buying and selling? Y'all think that's what happened? No. Jesus came in and he saw the desolation, what they were doing to God's house. And he said, my father's house should be a place of prayer, not a place to make money. And he went through and he turned those tables over. Jesus was angry. So we know that we can be angry, but we also saw, at the same time, we know that we shouldn't be angry in another way. That's because there's different kinds of anger. There is a righteous anger. And then a sinful anger. Which one do you think we are most of the time we're angry? <laughs> sinful. Well, what is a righteous anger? Righteous anger is an anger that comes from what makes God angry. If something is making that would make God angry, it should make us angry. When we see people being taken advantage of, evil happening, that should make us angry. Now, most often, when I look back on this week, or even this morning, <laughs> I can say that my anger has not been a righteous anger, it's been a selfish anger. Stop fighting with your brother or your sister! Am I angry because he's not showing kindness and love to his sister? No, I'm angry because it's a problem and they're yelling and they're screaming and it's interrupting my day and my time and I've got to get up and I've got to take care of this, right? Any parent that's ever ridden in a car with their children for a long trip understands 
sinful anger. And we lose our temper. And we blame others. We blame our children. As we read, as our brother Rick read in James chapter 1, verse 20, it says, For man's anger, man's anger, does not accomplish God's righteousness. Now, over and over throughout Scripture, as we look at God and His characteristics, and we look at the times that He has become angry, angry with Israel because of some sin or, or some idolatry that's come in, how does God respond? Because when we look at the difference between sinful anger and righteous anger, we need to make sure that we understand when we are angry, rightly angry, if something has gone wrong, if something is evil, something is bad, something that would make God angry, we also respond the same way. You see, God, when He is angry, always acts in a way that brings us back to repentance. But that's not how we respond, is it? We look at people, and it's easy for us to vilify them. And we think things like, you know, this world would be a much better place if he or she or this person or that person was just gone. And we might even pray, God, isn't it time that they come and meet you? <laughs> think about that. Now, there are some people that I don't agree with, probably on most things. There are things going on in our country that I don't like, that I can get upset about. But does that anger lead me to a righteous anger? Is that, is that to a point where I'm praying, God, reveal yourself to these people, convict their hearts, that they might repent and know you? Or am I thinking, God, just get them out of our country, out of our life, so that things can be better for me? There is a difference between a righteous anger and a sinful anger. And anger affects all areas of our life. Jesus says, I tell you, anyone who is angry with his brother, anger messes up our relationships with one another. How many of you know someone that has left a church because they got angry at another person in that church? I'm going to leave this church because they made me angry. They pushed my buttons. They helped me lose my temper and I've got to go find it at a different church. It affects our relationships. When we are angry with our spouse or with our kids, it creates friction and problems, doesn't it? I've had this this past well, I'm not going to be specific. <laughs> this is much easier when you're not in here. I can talk about you. <laughs> not that she was in the wrong, but that I was in the wrong, and I was angry at her. This did happen. That brought me in, uh, to another example. It's not even in my, in my passage. I wish I had the picture. There's a picture of our, our bathroom. I was changing the toilet seat. It was time to be changed. And there's a reason that you don't use metal bolts on a toilet. It's because metal bolts rust. And once metal bolts rust, it becomes almost impossible to get them out. So after being under this toilet, contorting my body in ways that make all kinds of muscles very tired and very sore and very hurt, and after being frustrated uh, beyond no end with trying to get this bolt to turn but it won't and it's stripping out, I finally locate another way to, to, to take this toilet seat off by actually using a hacksaw to cut through the bolts, which if you've ever done that before, you know is not very fun. So it, it's a great way to let out that anger because you're holding the hacksaw and you're like, oh, oh, oh. And Anna comes home after I've done this and, and worked on it for an hour, and I, I tell her, I say, you haven't done anything, but I just want you to know, I'm angry. 
and I want to be angry at somebody, so just give me a reason. <laughs> Maybe I didn't say it like that. <laughs> but I lost my anger. It was frustrating. Was that a righteous anger or was that a sinful anger? That was a sinful anger. And it messed up my relationship with my wife that day. Well, anger changes and strains and puts a burden upon our relationship. But anger also puts a hindrance in our worship. Verse 23, so if you are offering your gift on the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar first and go be reconciled with your brother. And then come and offer your gifts. You might be here this morning and you might be wanting and desiring to worship with the Lord, but there is this anger that you have at another person. Or maybe it's not even a person, maybe it's just the society or culture in general. Maybe you watch the news before you came to church, which is a bad idea. Read your Bible before you come to church. That's a better idea. But maybe you come here this morning and you've got something in you that you're just angry about. Have you ever tried to come before the Lord? Have you ever tried to worship with anger sitting and residing in your heart? It doesn't work. It's very difficult. Because it stops us, blocks us, and hinders us. It draws us away. Anger affects all areas of our life, and yet it's the easiest sin for us to justify, and so we're okay with it. The only other sin that I can think of that we are so easily to, to forgive and let go as Baptists Maybe eating too much. <laughs> but we let sin go. Even the small sin of just being angry. And not righteous anger, but sinful, selfish, self-serving anger. And we let it go. And we justify it. And we get our friends and our family to justify it. Did you hear what she said to me? Did you see what he did? Oh, I can't believe I agree. I've yet to find it in God's word that gives me complete and open freedom to be to grumble. You know, they didn't sing the song I wanted. They haven't done this around the church that they should have. My work is going like this. Those fools, those idiots would just do it the right way. Guys, that is a sin that we let come into our heart and creep in because it's so easy for us to write it off. It's so easy for us to pass that responsibility. I wouldn't be angry if they had made me angry. Take responsibility. I'm angry. Lord, I need to confess that to you. Lord, I am selfish and it comes from a place of selfishness. And I need you, Lord, to help me kill that in my life. And Lord, if there is anger in me, may it be a righteous anger. Lord, may I look out and see people defaming your name and and let it be a righteous anger with the desire to bring them to repentance, Lord. That they may know you. And they may worship you. This passage is about righteousness. This passage is about anger. But in this passage is also about our heart. I don't know what it says in your Bible, in your translation, but this passage in my Bible, the, the caption, the title of it, which, by the way, is not in Scripture. You don't go to the Greek or the Hebrew and find these head titles everywhere. These are man-made. But it says, murder begins in the heart. See, this is a heart issue. This is about what is going on on the inside. 
We can look on the outside and we can tell whether or not someone has murdered anybody. But it's real hard to see someone's heart and see if they're harboring anger and bitterness, contempt for another person. It is about heart. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, verse 19, For from the heart come evil thoughts, murderers, adulterers, sexual immoralities, thefts, false testimonies, and blasphemies. These are the things that defile a man. Out of our heart comes murder. You see, because murder never started anywhere other than anger. And it's interesting that Jesus began here. And I don't know if it's because it was one of the most easily uh, justifiable sins that we allow to creep in our life and that we allow to hold on to. Or if it's because this was the first sin. Outside of the fall, outside of Adam and Eve breaking God's command and eating from the tree of life, What's the first crime that we see in the Bible? Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. This is the first crime recorded in God's Word. Chapter 4, verse 4 of Genesis. And Abel presented an offering some of the firstborn of his flock and the fat portions. The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. Cain was furious, and he was downcast. And then the Lord said to Cain, why are you furious? And why are you downcast? You, if you do right, won't you be accepted? But you, but if you do not do right, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you. But you must master it. Amen. He even has this opportunity. The Lord tells him, why are you upset? Your brother has not done anything to you. He did what was right. You could do right. Cain said to his brother, Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. And then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's guardian? And then he said, What have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Someone did some research wouldn't even take much. I think all of us could guess it, but they found out that there is no emotion, no emotion that brings us closer to harming or murdering someone than the emotion of anger. It comes from the heart. Jesus is concerned with the heart. That's why he says, if you come into God's house, if you're coming to worship him, if you're coming to bring your gift and your offering to lay at the altar, but you remember that this sin is on you, it's in you, you have this residing in your heart, leave it there. I don't care about your outward appearance. I care about your inward heart. Leave this place. Go take care of that. Reconcile with your brother. And then come back and worship. what Micah chapter 6 is talking about. The Lord does not desire the offering of thousands of bulls. He wants your heart. He wants your heart. If I'm honest, it's real easy for me to look back over this week and say, you know, I haven't hurt anybody physically. I haven't murdered anybody. But if I look back and I look at my heart and I look at how anger has crept in and I look at how selfishness has resided in me and I look at my life 
at the parts that you don't see, but only God knows. And I see just how sinful and selfish I am. And it reminds me how much I need Jesus. I don't know where you are today. I don't know what's on your heart this morning. I don't know if you're angry at somebody holding on to resentment or hurt or pain. Maybe today is the day that we confess that sin and we say, God, take this from me because it does no good. Man's anger never brings about the righteousness of God. Maybe you tried to worship this morning. Maybe you didn't feel His presence. Maybe, maybe you couldn't even sing because something was stopping you. Maybe it's time for us to stop looking at our outward appearance and start looking at our inward. We want to give you a chance to respond. Please stand if you will. As God calls, will you come? Sunday. Oh, this is amazing.